Hello from the heartland. My name is Jenna, and this is Smarter News. News when it matters and why it matters. Our Smarter series features unique people who help us think and live smarter. Well, I'm really excited about our guest today. I'm excited about all our guests, quite frankly, <laughs> but I'm really excited about our next guest for a host of different reasons. Dr. Marty McCary is a professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He has a background in surgery, but his current research really focuses on the underlying cause of disease, which is a great topic to have an expertise on during this time. He's also an author of a few books, but one that just hit the New York Times bestselling list, which is The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It, also an appropriate topic. Over the course of my journalism career, I've spoken to Dr. McCary many times on any number of random topics, and I've watched his work over the last year with some great interest for for the topics that he's choosing to tackle and the reasons why he's choosing to tackle them. So let me just share this with you. Here are some of his recent editorials in the Wall Street Journal. One, the title is The Power of Natural Immunity. The other, the flimsy evidence behind the CDC's push to vaccinate children. And yet another one that just came out, The Case Against Mass for Children. So you can see these are really big, important topics. He's a very unique perspective. The more voices that we can add to the conversation, hopefully the clearer we get on this very developing story. And I like to emphasize that because we are in the middle of a developing story, searching for certainty that may or may not exist right now. And I'm sure Dr. McCary has some thoughts on that. It's great to have you with us, Dr. McCary. What has the last year, what has that been like for you? Well, great to, great to be with you, Jenna. Um, you know, the last year has been quite a ride because um, we need an open discussion of different medical ideas and unfortunately, it's been tough. You know, it's hard to have that sort of open forum um, during COVID because when we issue out a recommendation, we've got to do it with such strength and, and consensus. And some things there's a lot of consensus around. Other things, there's sometimes there's group think. So as you know, from my background, I like, I like to push the field. And so we like to put out there ideas that we're not thinking about that we should be thinking about. And that's been my whole career focus in healthcare. How difficult or challenging has it been to be a voice for some ideas that may not fit the consensus? Well, I'm used to it. You know, when we started talking about medical mistakes and patient safety as a cause of death of the United States and how it would rank as a high cause if we actually measured it appropriately, there was a fair amount of backlash. And then over time, the field accepted that patient safety is an important discipline of study. And now there's tremendous work in the field of patient safety nationwide. Um, before, you know, I was involved in something called the surgery checklist that was popularized in a book by Tulgawandi called the checklist manifesto, which said, look, we should be doing things more standardized in medicine rather than it be more the wild west and people flying in blind. And then with COVID, and then again, with the opioid epidemic, we were sounding the alarm on that early. And my research team has the luxury of pivoting quickly to address these issues. So when COVID was happening in Wuhan, we quickly got on the phone with the doctors in Wuhan. And I was just amazed at how in the media, there, were, there was all this speculation and sort of pundits, you know, with their opinions on it. And I'm thinking, get to the, you know, the sort of, as you know, as a true journalist, you know, you need to get dirty. You need to get on the front lines and talk to people. So that's what we started doing with COVID. And that's how I got into COVID early on. What did you learn from speaking to those doctors in Wuhan? Well, it was very interesting. The idea that somehow it was going to be contained, it was very clear to us that that was a notion that we needed to abandon, that somehow it would just die out in China as SARS died out in Asia. And um, the SARS example, um, you know, I think gave people at the very highest levels some sort of comfort that, you know, it may trickle over here, but it may, it may just very well peter out. And that's kind of where they banked. And then when it happened in Italy, Italy, then it was 100% obvious. Then it was like, okay, that was a reasonable hypothesis, but now it's proven wrong. Like it cannot be epidemic in two countries and we're going to be immune. So that's when I took to the airwaves, uh, called up friends like yourself and said, hey, look, I, I really feel like I've got something to say that's not being said. And I went on 
CNBC and uh, basically sounded the alarm. This is way before people were paying attention. A couple of us were doing a couple doctors. And then one of the Sunday morning talk shows said, look, hundreds of thousands of Americans are going to die. We've got to take this seriously. And then um, quickly started talking about universal masking when there was a lot of debate around that. Said, look, this is just something we got to do. We have a scary, right? We didn't know if we were going to lose 1% of our nation's children. We didn't have data on how it disproportionately affects older or comorbid individuals. So it was one of those good examples of how we need more vehicles to transmit information efficiently. And we can't rely on retrospective case reviews by the CDC or NIH grant funding to support research. They have a a cycle of about six months to fund research. So we had all of these important questions in the United States that everyday Americans were asking all of us physicians, how does it spread? When are you most contagious? Do masks work? None of those questions had research behind it. We couldn't do any research for six months. It was as if we were paralyzed with a a lack of funding, with an infrastructure that couldn't pivot, with an NIH that already allocated all their $42 billion. And as a result, we had a vacuum of information, of data. And because of that vacuum, political opinions filled it, unfortunately. And as you know, we live in a country where people have very, very strong opinions, even if they have no idea what they're talking about. Well, uh, fair point, Dr. McCary. And yes, I believe I have witnessed that as I'm sure our audience has as well. I just want to ask you, this is not the topic of our conversation, but I just have to ask you because you were in contact with doctors in Wuhan. And we just reported over the last week that Wuhan is again doing citywide testing and there's concern there about more cases. Does it matter to you where this virus emerged? What do you think of the lab leak theory? How important is that to us knowing how to prevent another pandemic from happening in the future? Well, so early in the pandemic in April, it was very clear to me that it was an infected lab worker who was patient zero who went to Wuhan Central Hospital. And I said that on television, again, took a fair amount of arrows for it. But, you know, there's too many people, I think, in medicine and healthcare that are afraid to speak their mind because of the consequences or being, you know, shouted at by some disgruntled person. We need an open dialogue in this country. We don't want to be reckless with ideas and theories. But if anyone who's worked in a laboratory knows that respiratory virus transmission to a lab worker is fairly common, it happens a lot. We've all seen it or, you know, we're not necessarily with respiratory, but with lab errors and lab accidents, we've all, anyone who's worked in a lab knows that. Now, also, we forget about history and you you can relate this as as a um, journalism uh, scholar. So basically, we forget history all the time. There was a major lab leak in 1977 in China of the H1N1 virus that killed 700,000 people. The Chinese were injecting it into their military recruits after they likely, presumably, gave them an experimental vaccine before. But they were definitely injecting it in their military recruits. And that strain killed 700,000 people. And then in 19, uh, sorry, in 2004, after SARS, SARS had petered out and it was basically eliminated. SARS was gone. By the way, a lot of the experts predicted SARS was going to come back with a vengeance. And, you know, all of the figures that we hear from, they were all in agreement. They were all wrong. But a year later, after SARS was basically eliminated, the Chinese were, um, experimenting with the SARS virus in a lab and it got out and it, it infected lab workers a year later. Luckily, it didn't spread then. Now, I think they're wrestling with the fact that they did massive containment. It was successful from a viral transmission standpoint. They've got a lot of people susceptible and their Chinese vaccine is only say 50 to 60% effective. We don't have good numbers on it. So they've got a, a susceptible portion of their population right now they're dealing with. That's that's interesting. And it leads into a a nicely into a conversation, pardon me, on natural immunity, which is something that you wrote about quite a bit, because that's been one of the big questions about all of this. If it is true that the number of actual infections is exponential to the ones that we have positive cases for, then what does natural immunity really look like? And can we actually reach herd immunity? And I'm curious before I launch into that, because I have a lot of questions on that topic, have any of your ideas that you've written about over the last year and a half changed 
with the surfacing of the Delta variant? Is there anything that that's adding something that's giving you pause or a different perspective? Yeah, I think we always need as physicians to have the humility to recognize that what we may have just proclaimed a day ago could be wrong and we need to evolve our strategy as the data come in. We always have to have that humility. And so with Delta, it did throw things um, you know, backwards. And we always knew that the remaining 10 to 20% of the population with no, the 10 to 20% of the adult population with no immunity was going to get infected. We always knew that. And so when I put out last winter in February that we were going to see massive declines in the spring and a normal summer, basically Delta um, threw a monkey wrench into that because we always knew, and I had said at the time of that projection, that seasonally we were going to see COVID come year to year as a seasonal virus, and we were going to see it eventually hit that population with low epidem epi epidemic growth curves that are stretched out, nothing like we had seen before. And that was what every single, every single expert was projecting was that in the fall, we were going to see something that looks like a mild flu season or possibly a moderate flu season among that 10 to 20% of adults with no immunity. Well, Delta hyper accelerated that infection in that group. And that's why we're seeing this bump now. It's it projected to peak at late August, early September. It may or may not circulate through schools. That's an unknown. We don't even, we don't even know really what the case fatality rate is in kids with Delta, but we think it's very low. Um, so that it did, Delta did change things in that way. And I think we have to be prepared for things that viruses that don't read the textbooks. Right, exactly. They're not listed. The virus isn't listening to the news the same way that we are. Uh, the Power of Natural Immunity was the title of the editorial that you wrote. I should point out, by the way, I read the titles of the editorials. I forget to mention, Dr. McCary, that that sometimes you get, don't get to write your own titles for editorials. <laughs> right. I wish we could. <laughs> I know. So I just, I just want to point that out. It's the little secret that you learn when you work in the news and you write something and then the title is totally different than what you were intending. Anyhow, this was a really interesting editorial on natural immunity and the title seems appropriate, the power of natural immunity. How would you define natural immunity when it comes to COVID? So once you have the infection and you recover, you've got antibodies and memory B cells and T cells that work and they protect your body just as we were designed to, to, to have uh, with them. That's how the immune system works. And so those who had the infection appeared early on in the pandemic in 2020 to have a very high degree of protection. As a matter of fact, we were not seeing people get reinfected. There were rare cases, but they were very mild. And we were not seeing people get severely ill. To this day, we do not see people get severely ill after they've had the infection. So if they've had the infection, we call that natural immunity. They have natural immunity. Now, the debate has been going on, and partly this something I ignited, I'll admit, is that those with natural immunity may have very good protection, may be as good, a little better, or a little worse than vaccinated immunity. We don't know. The data we're not in, and I was very clear to point out, right now it appears that natural immunity is powerful and durable, but we can't say that one is better than the other. Well, guess what? The test of time now is showing that natural immunity is strong, it's effective, and it's going strong at 15 months into the pandemic, we don't see se severe illness after natural infection, after people get it and recover. I would never recommend anyone try to get the infection. Vaccination, vaccinated immunity is a million times safer. But for the 30 to 50% of Americans who have natural immunity, including 30 to 50% of the non-vaccinated, they have a reasonable explanation to say, you know what, I'm going to hold off on the vaccine because my, I have antibodies circulating. I've been tested. I've had the infection. I was ill. And it turns out natural immunity is real. And a study out of Israel just showed that it's 6.7 times better than vaccinated immunity. The CDC last week put out a study showing the opposite, but that study was very flawed. They said that of those who had the infection, the reinfection rate was 2.3 times higher in people with natural immunity than those who had been vaccinated. Therefore, everyone should get vaccinated, even if they had the infection. And we're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. If you had the infection, 
your rate of getting reinfected was 0.09%, and none of those cases were reported as severe zero. So natural immunity appears to be effective, durable. We should recognize it. Unfortunately, we're seeing the politicalization of the human immune system, but we should recognize it. That's So I'm pulling up the article. I have it on my desk because I just read it over the weekend, the study that came out of Kentucky looking at reinfection rates between those vaccinated or those unvaccinated that both had infections in the previous year. And one of the things that they, the CDC does point out is that they said that they weren't really able to confirm through genome sequencing, which would definitively prove that if someone had the virus previously, that this was now a new infection. So they even admitted in some of their own limitations, and we know those limitations exist for any number of reasons, that there were questions that that surfaced with this. One of the questions that came up for, for me reading this study, and it actually came up with this about natural immunity as well, is whether or not you have to be symptomatic to qualify for having had an infection and whether or not a reinfection would mean that you would also have to be symptomatic to qualify, or we're just talking about a positive test or a positive, positive antibody test. If that was available to you, how do you navigate that question? So I've got a lot of, um, patients and friends who asked me that exact question. And here's what we know is that if you have, if you get the infection, if you test positive, you've got some immune response the level of immune protection is probably correlated with how severe your COVID infection was. And so if you've had just an asymptomatic case, I wouldn't trust that, that protection. I would go out and get the standard vaccine regimen. If I had mild symptoms, I might get one dose, or arguably you could make a case that you, you want to see the data play out and you're going to hold off. If you had a severe infection or severe symptoms, even if you're not hospitalized, the Cleveland Clinic study found no added benefit of vaccinating people with that form of natural immunity. So I've heard you say two things about the vaccine. I've heard you say that it's it's okay, it's reasonable for someone to let the data play out, but that also it's useful and that the vaccination would be a hundred times. I, mean, I don't know if I'm quoting you directly and I, I should be Dr. McCary <laughs> was many times safer than just trying to get infected with the virus that causes COVID-19. So you do see a role for vaccination in some cases. Are you concerned at all when you're, when you're talking about letting the data play out? Is there a lingering question in your mind about the efficacy or the safety of the vaccine? Every adult American should get vaccinated if they've not had COVID symptoms in the past. If you, in other words, the non-immune really need to get vaccinated. Um, where I have this conversation sometimes with somebody who's susceptible, that is, they have no immunity in their system is they'll say, oh, I'm not going to get the vaccine. I'm just going to go out there and get the infection. And that's where I say, no, the vaccine's about a thousand times safer than the infection. Infection is dancing with the devil. I mean, trust me, people in the hospital on a ventilator will tell you being on a ventilator, not being able to breathe is the worst feeling in the world. Patients have described it to me when we extubate them. You don't want to be in that situation. Unfortunately, a lot of people are getting religion too late on that. You know, they know somebody or somebody had a close call. So for those folks, trust me, you don't want to get the infection and risk that, even though it's a small risk in people young and healthy. So when it comes to natural immunity and the vaccine, you've also mentioned that maybe one dose of a vaccine, this is something you wrote about in the Wall Street Journal, might be appropriate for someone that had a symptomatic case, it sounds like would be ideal if in this sort of scenario. Why, why would you say tailor it to your need and not necessarily follow the guidance that's coming from a Pfizer or Moderna or the CDC. So early on when the, vac in the, when the vaccine was being rolled out, it was a very scarce supply and, and we were rationing and many of the old guard establishment and the FDA were sort of in denial that we were rationing. And those of us uh, who had looked at the data on one dose being pretty effective, 92% effective at the time at four weeks, and very effective in preventing against severe illness, at least in the short term. And we understood, yeah, the second dose may help with long-term durability of your immune protection. But while we were rationing, many of us were saying, let's focus on first doses. Why would you give 100 swimmers in the ocean if you only had 20 life preservers? Why would you give people two life preservers when you have a limited scarce supply? Well, England did that strategy 
and they saved more lives because of it. We were really unsuccessful in convincing the public health leaders to do it here. We would have saved tens of thousands, at least more American lives. So that was the rationale. Now, by just get by just getting the vaccine, just get everyone, just get one dose. We're not going to go into the two. We're not going to give you the warning that you're going to feel sick by the second one. We're not going to all this stuff. Just everyone get in line and get one shot. That's right. And England did that. So all the vulnerable people, anyone who is at risk, you get one dose. Once we get everybody vulnerable, vaccinated, then come back for your second. And there's no harm to getting it at two months or three months. I got my second dose at three months. You get actually better long-term protection the more you space out the interval. And that's been studied with Pfizer and Oxford AstraZeneca. Then I... Um, Sorry, go ahead. Or you can no, I sort of interrupted you. I'm sorry. I interrupted your thought about vaccination doses and, and really tailoring it to what your personal situation might, might be, whether yeah. or not it's you have a previous infection or, 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 or not. That's right. And you'll hear people say, you know, I, I was wiped out. I was in bed for two days after my vaccine dose. And what we've noticed is that people who had prior infection, that infection is like getting one or two doses of the vaccine. So when you get an, every additional boost of a vaccine or dose of a vaccine hits you more, hits you harder because you're exponentially increasing your in immune response, your inflammatory response. And so, and by the way, you get exponentially more antibodies. You get like tenfold more antibodies with the second than you do the first. Well, the, the immune system is working, it's revving up and it, that's why people feel sick more so after the second dose. So a couple of things in kids, the dose is probably a little too high in my personal opinion in adolescence. It never made sense to me that we give a 50 year old heavy man, the same dose as a tiny 12 year old girl. And guess what? We're seeing myocarditis complications in adolescence and young people in their early twenties, because it's probably too high of a dose. Their immune system is too active, is too strong. So we want them to have immune protection if they haven't had natural immunity. So let's, um, how about we do one dose? Now, a study out of Tel Aviv University showed that one dose was 100% effective in kids 12 to 15. So if it's 100% effective, and we know these complications are clustered around the second dose, one dose is reasonable for now until we get more data. And that's what I recommend for adolescents. And then the other area where I recommend one dose is people who absolutely refuse to get vaccinated. We have experience with non-compliant people in medicine as doctors. And, you know, sometimes my grandfather, who was a pharmacist, said, you've got to split a pill in two to help somebody be able to swallow it. And if somebody is adamant they're not going to get vaccinated, one dose is better than none. And I'd rather convince them to try to get one dose for now and get that partial immune protection, then give up on them. It's an interesting analogy with the pill is what I think we could probably all understand and having to do that a couple of times, either for ourselves or for our kids. Do you see the virus that causes COVID-19 to be like the chicken pox? There's so many uh, comparisons to that with the Delta variant because of its contagiousness, but I actually got the chicken pox when I was little. I remember it very well. I'm glad I'll never get it again. You know, I'll never have this a symptomatic chicken pox ever again, knock on wood for the most part. Is that what you see with this virus that you'll get it once and then your, your subsequent potential reinfections would be mild or it, are we in this period where we could be getting vaccinated every year, potentially similar to the flu? I don't think we'll require, I don't think anyone's going to be required to get boosters every year. I don't think it's, it'll be necessary and we'll cross that bridge when we get to it right now that if immunity is pretty good for young, healthy people. We're going to start with boosters with those immunosuppressed and maybe older Americans, but this will become a seasonal virus. COVID-19 will become a seasonal virus forever. And that is where I think the public has not yet accepted the fact that this is not something we're going to eradicate. Herd immunity is not elimination. It means it's slower, spreads in a slower fashion. It's going to be seasonal and by the way, there's four other seasonal coronaviruses that have circulated for decades. This will become the fifth one. And for people who don't like it, they can thank the gain of function researchers at the Wuhan Central Lab. But this is going to be a virus that is going to circulate. So if you got immunity, you're going to get a mild common cold-like illness, or at least you're going to be susceptible to it year to year. 
And maybe that's okay. If it's not causing, remember, our battle has always been against death and disability and overrun hospitals, not against the sniffles and, you know, a little bit of common cold symptoms. So I think we need to acknowledge that this is going to be a seasonal virus. How long do you think it'll be between uh, where it is now and a seasonal virus that we, we manage, that we live with? Well, I think the breakthrough infections are the early sign of the seasonality of this virus. And I think people are freaking out right now. The breakthrough infections are causing a lot of alarm. And I think one of the reasons, one of the ways in which that alarm is founded is that we still have that 10 to 20% of adults with no immunity and those with breakthrough infections can transmit it to them. That was the big pivot in the CDC guidance last month. But Remember, that's still the, the vaccinated people are still the minority of transmitters in the community. Less than 10%, we think, of the transmission is among vaccinated people. And the reason is that when you're vaccinated, your window of contagiousness is much more narrow. It's probably one day. And you can still feel great early on and give it to somebody, but your immune system kicks in quickly. So it's not like someone who has no immunity who gets the infection, they can transmit it for a much longer period of time. And that's still primarily where it's being spread today, households and private gatherings in areas with very low vaccination rates. Why do you think natural immunity is not talked about more as part of public health policy from the CDC, anyone in power in, in giving a more broad picture of the pandemic? Why? Why not talk about natural immunity every time that you talk about vaccines? I wish we did talk about it more. And I think what happened early on is we've got an old guard medical establishment. They're not bad people. I'm a big fan of Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins. I have a tremendous amount of respect for them, but you know, they think in a bit of an old school way. So early on in this pandemic, they hedged their bet that a vaccinated immunity was going to be what gets us out of this. And vaccinations are amazing, right? It's amazing. 200 million Americans have gotten vaccinated with an impeccable safety profile safer than any vaccine we've ever made. And it is the deterrent. If you look at countries struggling right now with a massive death toll, it's because they have not had have access to vaccines. But at the same time, natural immunity is a real contributor. So I think the old guard establishment dug in early and they said, the way we're going to get out is through vaccinations. And they created this barometer of percent of Americans vaccinated. And that was going to be the ultimate path to, you know, being in a better spot. And I think was that again, we have to have humility. And as the data are now showing the natural immunity is incredibly powerful. We've got to recognize that is contributing to population immunity. And by the way, when you totally discount it, as it has been, as has been done, you alienate a lot of people. You disenfranchise up to half of the non-vaccinated who are, who may say like for good reasons, Hey, I had it. That's why I'm not getting it. And that's, reasonable. That is reasonable. If you had COVID and recovered, you don't want to get it. Right now you have as much data to support you as people who say you should get it. That's equal data. And so um, I think that's where we went wrong is we just, and that's kind of politics today. It's like people dig into a position and you defend it. In science, we should be different. We should suggest something, say, I don't know when we don't know, and be willing to change our strategy as the data change. Well, it's good for us just to hear a little bit more of a broader conversation about natural immunity as well. I want to ask you as, as, as well about this editorial, the case against masks for children, because this is when we talk about people dug in, right? This is where everyone is dug in over whether or not you are for masking or if you're against masking and the lines are pretty severe. And now we're starting into the school year. And this is becoming part of the conversation about also vaccination and whether or not adults in the area have to get vaccinated for the kids, if the kids have to get vaccinated, when, when are younger kids going to be eligible for vaccinated? I know you have a lot of strong opinions about this, but why did you feel the need with all that's changing and all that still a little bit unknown about the virus? Why did you feel compelled to write this editorial now before the school year? <laughs> First of all, gosh, I, I hated that title they put on it. Um, the case it? against masks for children, just so everyone knows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that wasn't what you would oh, choose. Gosh. Okay. <laughs> no, no. And I think anyone who reads it would say that's not what the article is saying. So 
But you know, you know how the media works, right? They they look for eyeballs. It's catchy. It, it got my attention, Doctor McCary. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> it, and it got actually, my attention too. Uh, yeah, I bet there's a. There, I actually think the the paragraphs at the end of it, I've highlighted several of them, are what I'd like to talk to you about. But why don't you clarify what I mean? What is your case for or against masks? Does it fall into two pots? How do you feel about this? So again, I think Jenna, we've used an all or nothing approach with this issue of masking kids. And I think it's just far more nuanced than that. For example, in areas where there's low rates of background infection in the community, or even moderate rates, the data show that the masks don't have any impact in the transmission. Um, in With kids that who are vaccinated, now we've got 40% of adolescents vaccinated. They don't need to be wearing a mask. And by the way, we've been treating masks as if there's no downside to masks, as if there's no harm to kids. And the reality is some kids do very well with masks and other kids struggle and they struggle big time. And that's selectively in the population of the 5% of American children with a learning, cognitive or physical dis disability. And it's also prevalent in the 25% of American children in school who wear glasses and they have trouble getting a good seal and they fog up. Their, they can't see sometimes. We see it in the operating room with our new medical students. We have to tape the mask to their face because it's hard to get a good seal. And if they don't do it properly, they can't see it well in the operating room. They, we see them, their glasses partially or completely fog up sometimes. And you've got to have a human connection in child development. A mask for a couple of weeks or months, fine. That's not going to have any downside. But you talk, we're coming on two years now, and when you cover their faces, they lose the ability to visualize expressions, to communicate through expressions, to visualize the pronunciation of words, which is important in phonetic development. It does masks change breathing patterns in kids. They slightly elevate CO2 levels in their system. Now, again, short period of time, not a big deal. I've been wearing a mask as a surgeon most of my life. But you're talking about kids in development, and we know that when a kid switches from nose breathing to mouth breathing, which is what some kids do with a mask, that chronic mouth breathing is bad for your child development. Chronic mouth breathers, and we've seen this with something called nasal adenoids, their palate develops differently because they're mouth breathing chronically. Their mandible develops differently. Their teeth may not close completely because of the chronic mouth breathing because of the change in development. There's a syndrome called adenoid face where a child has an elongated face because they're not nasally breathing chronically over many years. So the idea that somehow masks have no downsides is a notion we need to abandon. And my issue with the across the board, all or nothing approach on either side of this issue is that the uniform K through 12 mask all kid requirement the CDC issued did not account for all of these issues and the fact that some kids struggle, some areas of infection are very low in many parts of the country and some kids are vaccinated. So there's never been a case of transmission from child to, to teacher in the North Carolina study of 90,000 kids during the pandemic. Are we really forcing kids to do something that just because some adults don't want to get vaccinated. And if so, I don't think that's fair to children. So the point of the article was that some kids do fine with masks and should wear them and other kids struggle and we need to give them special attention. So two points that you brought up in your piece as well is that you did a new, there's a new research study that you did uh, with your colleagues, your research team that you've mentioned that looked at funding from the National Institutes of Health and that a very small percentage actually went to funding research, clinical research on COVID, and not a single grant was dedicated to studying masks in children. Tell us about that. It's amazing. We issue such a strong, vigorous recommendation for every one of our 56 million American kids, as if they're all the same, to wear a mask with no research whatsoever. We studied $42 billion of NIH funding last year, not a single grant dedicated to masks and kids. Matter of fact, of the 42 billion the NIH spent last year in, on research, 1.8% went to COVID clinical research. And even that, there were 57 grants on health disparities in COVID, but only four on transmission. So health disparities, that's an important issue, as is substance abuse in COVID. That was about 57 grants as well, uh, 54, I'm sorry. But only two on if masks work 
in adults and not on kids, we have lost our sense of urgency with this pandemic to address the problem. And that's my concern right now. If the NIH, CDC, and public health officials feel so strongly about this, how about fund the, a study and we can actually have some data? Do you think wearing a mask makes sense in some scenarios for yes. adults and for kids? You do. And so one of the things that's come up with the Delta variant is the intensity of the viral load and the contagiousness of the virus. And so the argument for masks is you get a lower dose of virus. If you're wearing a mask, you give off. Does, is that anything that you think is relevant during this time where we're seeing this rise in infections? Yes. I think if a kid is in an area with a Delta outbreak and the community transmission is high, they should be wearing a mask and a good quality mask. By the way, the cloth mask may not do much for the kids. And that means a good seal. And then, and, and I would um, exempt those with immunity, those who have vaccination immunity, adults, or the, sorry, adolescents. Um, so I think it's got to be individualized. Look, I wrote the first piece calling for universal masking in the United States last spring at the be beginning of the pandemic in the New York Times. Took a lot of arrows for it. And masks work. I, my patients in surgery wouldn't want me to operate without a mask. But with kids, I think we need to recognize that every kid is different and we shouldn't have hard and fast rules against kids with disabilities and who struggle. Well, and you also point out in the piece that it's part of a bigger picture. You mentioned that schools can adopt better ventilation. They can do distancing. You could divide students still into small groups that these other things actually have to be looked at that mask or masking for everybody on your list would not necessarily break into the top two. So what do you think if schools can do something and it's not necessarily masking, what is the best thing for schools to do as they head into the fall? Open the window, a uh, pod, uh, work on a basic distancing hygiene. You know, people, the kids are still getting the infection when the schools are doing all these things, but often they're getting them at home or with friends. You can't keep a child imprisoned for two years. They're going to interact, and we shouldn't. They're going to interact with other kids as they should. So we can do that with safe precautions. And I think this notion right now that we have to do whatever we can humanly do to reduce transmission at all cost is a flawed notion because suicides are way up. Nutrition um, is, you know, services are, are um, describing um, problems with hunger in schools. Sexual abuse has been up. I mean, suicide is a very real issue. Um, so right now we've taken this approach that we have to eradicate this thing at all costs. And the reality is we would never apply the masking rules that we have now for influenza. I think we've got to find a nice happy medium and say, you know what, if you have symptoms, you don't come to school. If you've been exposed, you wear a mask. If you're in an area with an active outbreak, like the high Delta communities now, everybody wears a mask. Doesn't matter if you're vaccinated or not. And I think we've got to have these adaptive approaches. Otherwise, we're just going to subject kids to policies where, quite honestly, if they had a say in them, they would point out what's what's wrong with them. <laughs> they do tend to say the most obvious things, these kids. I know that from my six and five year old sometimes that I'm like, shh, I don't know. <laughs> 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 We're doing the best that we can. You've mentioned a few times, Dr. McCary, arrows coming your direction. Yeah. What have you received the most criticism on? And what do you think about that? Yeah, so. Uh, you know, I'm used to it. I think it's good. I, I, I think that open different um, ideas are healthy. And so I like to push the field. I've got this tremendous privilege as a tenured professor at Johns Hopkins, who spends most of my time in public health. Um, I've had the chance to study with some of the best scientific minds, in my opinion, in the world. And I feel like I've got a platform that I want to use to talk about issues that we need to talk about that we are not talking about. Um, I'm a member of the National Academy of Medicine, studied epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. So I can go toe to toe with anyone. If we do it in a civil fashion, where we're not entrenched in some political you know, bias that um, we have to calibrate all of our scientific views to, and we can be open and honest and nonpartisan, I think that's good. I think that's healthy. And, you know, bring it on. So when the only thing that I, gives me a little heartburn 
is the titles on some of these news articles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we addressed that today. Then I think that's really important. I don't think a lot of people realize that. And it's really, really important to know that about editorials. You got to read the whole thing. And sometimes here's a tip. Sometimes I actually read from the bottom up because that way it slows you down. I know that sounds strange, but it sometimes works for me because it's like, it gets away some of the cashy stuff to what's really at the meat of it. I was thinking about Johns Hopkins, the hospital facility. And, and I, we did a little bit of a, a cool story on that. Uh, when it was first launched and developed in America and how ventilation was so key to the hospital as cutting edge ventilation at the time, you know, no one had any air conditioning or anything like that. And so it kind of, even you're just, you're mentioned about schools and ventilation. It seems like there's probably some obvious things that we can continue to do. And I'm just wondering what, what, like when you think of yourself and your family, what are you doing just to keep yourself healthy? And, and always, it doesn't necessarily have to be related to COVID-19. And I want to ask you about American healthcare before you go, but is there anything that you're following? You know, are you taking vitamin C every day? Like, what is it? What are the, what is the secret if you have one, Dr. McCary, that, or the advice that you're giving to your family and friends as they're looking at the uncertainty of the fall? Stay active. I think staying active is important for mental health and physical health. And by the way, when we told everyone stay at home, guess what happened? They gained on average 18 pounds. And it turns out the number one risk factor for COVID hospitalization is being overweight. 78% of hospitalizations were in those overweight or obese. We haven't been talking about obesity as we should, in part because we've had bad data. It's hard to collect data on obesity. It just doesn't show up in billing coding data that the uh, national databases collect. And the other problem is that there's a political incorrectness of talking about it because it's seen as fat shaming. Well, guess what? It's a major risk factor, maybe one of the biggest risk factors out there. Early on in the pandemic, I was asking ICU directors around the country who were, had just gone through that initial wave of COVID at the beginning of the pandemic. And I asked them, have you had any thin people die of COVID under age 50? Has anyone under age 50 died who's been totally healthy? And over and over again, I've heard, no, we may have had a couple people get really sick or on a ventilator, but no one who's died under 50 who has been in perfect health. And to me, that was the message we needed to get out, right? Um, and it wasn't that this is an old person's disease or virus. It selectively affects those with comorbid conditions. It could be a 12-year-old with morbid obesity and metabolic syndrome, which is a constellation of diabetes and other problems. It's rampant right now. And so when we break down the data of who really got hit hard, it was really those with comorbid disease. And I was, I was amused when people were saying, oh, you know what? We're seeing higher death rates and complications in African-Americans and other minority communities. And it's like, yes, the obvious thing is that the health status is markedly disproportionate in those communities. They don't have the luxury of going to a second home and having their kids in a separate room on a, in a Zoom suite. People live in smaller uh, spaces. They may be more relegated to public transportation and crowds. That was the conversation I wish we had early on that we were, were somehow avoiding or tiptoeing around. And I think as scientists, we've got to be very objective. It's interesting. We're thinking about public health policy, how different it would feel if someone came to the microphone and said to all Americans, I care about you. I love you. I want you to go out and get fresh air and walk around the block every single day. And then I also want to talk to you about vaccinations. And I like to talk to you about natural immunity too. But first, everyone needs to take a walk today. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wonder what, if for every time we hear the word vaccination or anytime we hear the word mass, if we also heard, take a walk, eat an apple, take a walk, eat an apple, <laughs> you know, you wonder what it would be like, just like a different, just an overall different tone. It's hard to look back. It's hard to judge what we, everyone we were doing in, in an emergency situation. So just a final question for you, the title of your book, which you did get to choose, I hope, uh, Dr. Bakary, yes. the price we pay, what <laughs> broke American healthcare and how to fix it. What are we learning about healthcare in America through this pandemic and how do we fix it? So the, the book was really designed to talk about the real reason why healthcare costs so much and why you're flying blind a lot of times and how you can navigate your care and, and this movement to push back and get at 
a different approach to health that deals with the underlying problems, not just the reactionary approach of throwing meds at people. We have the most medicated, most obese, the most disabled population in the history of the world right now. And we can't keep just throwing meds at the problem. Right now, um, compared to 10 years ago, we physicians have prescribed double the number of medications that we did five, uh, 10 years ago. Did disease really double in the last 10 years? No, we need to address our crisis of appropriateness over treatment, the medicalization of ordinary life over um, operating. These are things where we've got right now two problems in America, under treatment and over treatment, but by far over treatment dominates the problem. So there's a movement of us who are saying, can we treat more diabetes with cooking classes than just throwing insulin at people? Can we start talking about food as medicine? Can we talk about school lunches instead of just bariatric surgery in children? Can we talk about treating high blood pressure with yoga and sleep medicine approach rather than just throwing sleep meds at people or throwing antihypertensives at people? Can we talk about environmental exposures that cause cancer, not just the chemo that we used to throw at people? So this is the approach to redesign healthcare. It's not preventive medicine. That doesn't capture it. I mean, we're not talking about what age to start mammograms. We're talking about a complete redesign of the entire way we deliver healthcare. And it's not a theoretical, it's not a policy book. It is happening right now in the United States. And I had the privilege of profiling the people doing that. That's exciting. That actually is really exciting to hear uh, and to think that there's hope. Do you have hope, Dr. McCary? Hope I do. through this pandemic and hope about healthcare? I do. I'm very optimistic on healthcare, despite as, as, as often as I'm critical of our medical establishment. You know, a young generation of folks, they think differently and they're coming through medical school right now. They don't want to have the big home in the suburbs and show up to their jobs at the hospital you know, from eight to six every day until they retire. They don't want that. Social justice is a generational value. They want to be a part of something larger than themselves. They're fine living in a small place in a walkable community where they can be active. They are adamant about this issue of price gouging in medicine, something I write about in the book. We've gone around the country just, um, un, un, uh, covering this practice of hospitals suing people if they can't afford to pay their bill. Well, guess what? The students say, Marty, we want to do something about this. Let's go to court. And we go to court. I defend these people as a pro bono expert and we win a hundred percent of the time and we're shutting it down around the country. And the new paperback version of the book, the price we pay has an update where I show what is changing nationally from the results of these students. And I traveling around the country, helping people interpret and push back on a system that right now is engaging in predatory billing. And it violates everything sacred in medicine. When people come to a hospital, historically, these hospitals, by the way, are built by churches and philanthropists and other great people. They have always been a safe haven. And now they're being gouged or taken advantage of when they come to us as physicians. It's a disgrace to our great medical profession and it's something that we can fix. These are self-inflicted wounds and it's happening. And we're seeing the price of healthcare go down as disruptors are changing this entire dynamic. Well, through um, questionable editorial titles that you may disagree with and <laughs> arrows coming your direction, you're obviously working around the clock, Dr. McCary. So thank you for making time for us today and just giving us just these, these really important points to consider as we're all sharing the story together of this developing pandemic in America. And it's been a confusing time. So it's really great to have your voice and, and I look forward to you coming back. So thank you. Thanks, Jana. Great to see you again. Thanks for having me. Quick, concise, nonpartisan, smarter news, a refuge from the storm. I'm Jenna. Thank you for choosing smarter.